help me out here this morning. On the count of three, tell me what television show that was the theme to. Are you ready? One, two, three. All right, good. Then you are familiar with it. Uh, the Jeffersons, right? If you're unfamiliar with it, if you were not alive when the show was on television, I'm going to help you out a little bit. The Jeffersons was on the air and was a popular sitcom for 10 years. It started in 1975 and ran until 1985. Again, help me out here this morning and help those of, who may not know who these two people are. Uh, what's the man's name? George Jefferson, right? And what was his wife's name? Louise or Wheezy was her name, Wheezy Jefferson. And um, yeah, George was a self-made millionaire who owned uh, a business and, uh, and ran a business. Do you remember what business he owned and operated? Man, you guys are good. Dry cleaning business. Exactly right. And uh, when they made it big, when they finally moved on up to the east side, to the deluxe apartment in the sky, well, then their social circles kind of expanded and they got to know some other people. In fact, uh, name this person. Florence. Remember Florence? She was the sassy housekeeper who kept George Jefferson in check, okay? And uh, now, if you, had, if you struggled with that one, you're really going to struggle with this one because I struggled with these two people. I could picture them, but I did not know their names. Do you know who this couple is? Oh, I heard it. Somebody said it? Tom. And what was his wife's name? Helen. Who said Helen? Very good. Very good. Tom and Helen. And do you know their last name? Willis. Okay, these were the friends of uh, George and Wheezy Jefferson, and they made an appearance all the time. Now, here's what you, didn't, you may not have known, but the Jeffersons, it was a groundbreaking show because it featured the first interracial married couple on television. And that was a big deal in 1975. By the way... Um, the producers knew that it was such a big deal that they approached the female actress, her name is Roxy, by the way, uh, they approached Roxy and wanted to make sure that she was okay with having an on-screen husband who was white. And she laughed at the producers. And the producers were like, why are you laughing? And then she reached in her purse and pulled out a family portrait and her husband in real life is white. And as a matter of fact, you may not know, but did you know that Roxy Roker was married to Cy Kravitz and they had a son named Lenny Kravitz? I didn't know that till this week. But The Jeffersons was a groundbreaking television show that was breaking down the racial barriers and segregation that existed in America even back in 1975. The, Je the Jeffersons were declaring the message that we've been learning for several weeks now in the book of Acts that they're that all people are equal, that it doesn't matter the color of your skin, that all people are loved by God. And this racial divide was one that has existed for a long time. It existed in the first century back in the church. But it wasn't a racial divide of white versus black. It was more along the lines of, a, of an ethnic barrier or, or divide between Jew and Gentile. The Jews thought that they were superior in every way to all other races or, or ethnicities. They looked down their noses at people who weren't Jewish because they had been told their entire life that they were God's chosen people, that they were his children. And the Jews thought that it was insulting and offensive to even suggest that a Gentile could be loved by God, uh, let alone offered salvation by God. And in Acts chapter 11, uh, 10, we learned how God sent Simon Peter a Christ-following Jew, he sent Simon Peter to the home of Cornelius, a Gentile. And the whole reason that Simon was in the home of Cornelius was so that he could preach the message of salvation to a Gentile. And this was going to be a hard lesson for the Jews to accept. And that's what we're going to learn today. Um, but what we're learning through the story of Cornelius is this, that God never intended for the church to be exclusively for 
Jews. That he meant salvation, that he meant Jesus Christ for absolutely everyone. And that brings us to Acts chapter 11. The title of this morning's sermon is The Church as it was meant to be. We've been studying the book of Acts now for several weeks. This is the 22nd sermon in the series. And uh, this is what we've been learning is that Acts is the pattern for how we are supposed to be doing church in 2023. And the sermon that we're preaching today is one that is of vital importance. Because things are changing for the first century church and things were never going to be the same. And I hope that they're never going to be the same for us either after today. Well, what I'm going to do is we're going to walk through these verses in Acts chapter 11. There's 30 of them. We're going to outline it, and then we're going to study it, and then we're going to apply it a little bit later. But I've called this first section of verses the confrontation of Peter. Because what happens is Peter is going to return back to Jerusalem after he baptizes Cornelius in Caesarea. But here's the deal, before he can make it back to Jerusalem, the news about what he did in Caesarea made it back to Jerusalem, and now he's going to have to be dealing with some of the fallout and some of the anger directed towards him. So uh, the first three verses describe the charges that are brought against Peter, and they're pretty ridiculous, they're pretty trumped up. Let's read it, and then I'll explain it. Verse 1. Now the apostles and the brothers and sisters who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. And when Peter came back up to Jerusalem, the Jewish believers took issue with him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and you ate with them? We're not told how the news reached the, the, the Jews in Jerusalem or how they heard what happened. But it was only 50 miles between Jerusalem and Caesarea. And news always travels faster, it seems, than than we do. Uh, But what we do know is that the news got to Jerusalem before Peter did. And when he got there, boy, they were ready for him. Uh, They were already fired up. They had time to let their tempers build. uh, And they had a sense of outrage. And so when Peter shows up, they're ready to crucify him. All right? They're confronting him. The charge against Peter is that he went and he ate into, inside the home of a Gentile. And that would have made Peter unclean. Eating with Gentiles was unheard of. You just didn't do that. And as far as these Jews were concerned, they believed that Peter had committed a terrible sin. But what I find interesting is that uh, this was the same accusation that Jesus faced by the Pharisees, the Jewish religious leaders. Remember? In Luke chapter 15, verse 2, they came to Jesus and it says, And both the Pharisees and the scribes began to complain about Jesus, saying, This man receives sinners and he eats with them. How dare he? Well, now the same charge is leveled against Peter. And he's now going to explain his actions. He's going to clarify what it is that took place. And uh, it's contained here in verses 4 through 16, and uh, here's what you need to know before we read it. Uh, This is the third time that these events are recorded in Scripture. With each time the story is shared, we learn a little bit new information. So while it is you may be getting tired of hearing about the story of Simon Peter and Cornelius and Caesarea, what you need to understand is God is very intentional with His words. There's a reason that we're hearing this for the third time. Learning comes through repetition. And God, it is no accident that this is the third time the story is told. And so follow along as I read it and allow the Holy Spirit to remind you what it is we've studied so far. Verse 4. But Peter began and explained at length to them in an orderly sequence, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, an object coming down like a great sheet lowered by four corners from the sky, and it came to where I was. And I stared at it, and I was thinking about it, and I saw the four-footed animals of the earth, the wild animals, the crawling creatures, and the birds of the sky. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing unholy or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a voice from heaven answered a second time, what God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. 
This happened three times. And everything was drawn back up into the sky. And behold, at that moment, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea came up to the house where I was staying. And the Holy Spirit told me to go with these three men without any misgivings. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered into the man's house. And he reported to us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send some men to Joppa and have Simon, who's also called Peter, brought here. And he will speak words to you by which you will be saved, you and all your household. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as he did upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So this is the repeated story yet once again of the events that took place in Joppa and Caesarea and how Simon Peter went from Joppa into Caesarea, into the home of Cornelius and ended up baptizing Cornelius and his household. And there's a great lesson to be learned from Peter in these verses when he was faced with criticism that he did not deserve. Has that ever happened to you? Somebody was critical of something that you did and you frankly, quite honestly, didn't deserve the criticism? Learn a lesson from Peter. He didn't argue with them. He didn't get mad at them. He just said, let me tell you what happened. He faces the criticism when he least expects it, when he didn't deserve it, when he couldn't understand it. But instead of getting into an argument with them, he simply told them what had happened. And when you're faced with criticism that is unwarranted or unsolicited, what's your response? Because man, I wish I could be more like Simon Peter in this moment. So the only thing that I want to remind you about concerning the story of Simon Peter and Cornelius is that this was a big deal. Such a big deal that the story is repeated three times. Such a big deal that Dr. Luke devotes most of his time in the book to this story. 66 verses dedicated to this story so that we would understand this monumental truth. What monumental truth is that, you ask? Here it is. God loves all people. The gospel was taken to the Gentiles. And God wants to make sure that everyone understands that salvation is available for everybody, even Gentiles, and that he pours out upon them the gift of the Holy Spirit, just as the apostles received in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. So that's an amazing, humbling story as well. Because if somehow the apostles were getting a little bit too big for their britches, if somehow they were thinking, well, I'm better than everybody because, well, I was in the upper room and the Holy Spirit ascended upon me with tongues of fire and a great rushing wind, and I'm better than you are because that happened to me. If they were getting a little bit too big for their britches, God brings in this humbling lesson and gives the same Holy Spirit in the same way that those apostles received it in the upper room in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. And he gives it to these Gentiles. And once and for all, the lesson is declared, God loves all people. He wasn't kidding about it. So when Jesus in John chapter 3, verse 16 said, for God so loves the world, he didn't mean the Jews only. He didn't mean the white American Christians only. He didn't mean any specific group of people. He meant everybody. And Peter clarified his actions by declaring this truth. And finally, Peter ends up convincing the Jews. Peter's going to persuade his Jewish brothers that salvation through Jesus Christ is for everybody, not just the Jews. And so returning to our text, look at verses 17 and 18. Therefore, if God gave them the same gift as he gave also to us after believing in the Lord Jesus, who was I that could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, Well then, God has also grant, granted to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. Now I've hi highlighted and underlined just a few words and phrases in those two verses because I want you to see what Peter does in his argument. Because Peter reminds his Jewish brothers that this wasn't his plan. This wasn't my idea. This was God's plan. He was just being obedient to what it was God told him to do. And that is a great, great lesson to learn as well as you're faced with criticism. As long as you're doing what God has directed you to do, it doesn't matter what anybody else might say about it. 
All right? And notice their response. I love it. Verse 18, it says, and they quieted down. I love that. Their tempers, their anger, their elevated blood pressure, their raised voices, all of it quieted down. And God was bringing peace to the Jews as they were beginning to realize that this was all part of his plan. It must have been a hard thing, though, for these legalistic and prejudiced Jews to hear that this was part of God's plan. But thankfully, they eventually came to the same conclusion that Peter came to. Again, that is, that God loves all people equally. And the rest of the chapter is going to detail the happenings of the church in Antioch. Antioch was one of the largest cities in the first century Roman world. I didn't know this, but uh, scholars estimate that it had a population of about 300,000. That's a big city even by today's standards. And this city was home to wealthy and thriving Jewish, uh, a Jewish community. The first mention of Antioch in the New Testament was in reference to Nicholas, who was a convert to Christianity, who was one of the seven Greek-speaking Hellenistic Jewish leaders, chosen to serve the deacons in Acts chapter 6. And so that's the first time we hear of Antioch. Well, now we're going to see that the church was planted there, and we're going to learn about the happenings of that church, verses 19 through 21. And then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to Jews alone. You get it? They're still thinking that Jews are the only ones worthy to receive salvation. So we're just going to share the good news with our Jewish brothers and sisters. But there were some of them, um, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks as well, the Gentiles, preaching the good news of the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. And so this church in Antioch got its start, did you catch it? Through the persecution of Stephen, who was stoned to death in Acts chapter 7. And the Christians that were in Jerusalem were like, wow, we can't stay here, we got to get out of here. They're killing Christians, let's go to a different city and hide out. And a group of them went to Antioch and were staying there to flee the persecution that was happening in Jerusalem. And so while they're there, they're sharing their faith. They're, they're spreading the good news, and a church begins to be planted. And several people are coming to Christ. And as a result, it says in verse 19 that many Jews were coming to faith in Christ. But then verse 20 says they finally get it right. They finally realize that Jesus is for everybody. And then they begin to share their faith with Greeks. As, and then it says, as well as a large number of who, believe, who believed, turned to the Lord. But guess what? That gets the attention of the church in Jerusalem. They're hearing about these people living in Antioch, and they're like, what's going on with the people there? What, there's a church there? People are, are coming to Jesus? And so guess what the church in Jerusalem does? They send Barnabas to go check it out. Look at verses 22 through 24. The news about them, the Christians in Antioch, reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. When he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them with all resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and considerable numbers were added to the Lord. So the church in Antioch was booming, it was growing super fast, and the church in Jerusalem sends Barnabas to go check it out. They needed some boots on the ground, so to speak. They needed an eyewitness who could report whether or not the things they'd been hearing were true. And what's interesting is they choose Barnabas. Barnabas was quite a man. We met him earlier on in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 4 to be specific. Do you remember in Acts chapter 4 we were told that he was given the nickname Barnabas? It means son of encouragement. And he had some land. He was rich. And he sold the land, and he gave all the money from that land to the church. So it makes sense that the church in Jerusalem sends Barnabas. He's trustworthy, he's generous, and he will do what he, what he does best. He will encourage them. Did you see it there in verse 23? He's doing it in Antioch. He's encouraging them. 
And then I like verse 24. It reiterates what we already know to be true. It says that he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith. But then Barnabas does something absolutely shocking. I I just can't believe it. And maybe it's good that it's prefaced by saying that uh, Barnabas was a man who was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, because what he's getting ready to do might cause a lot of the Christians to kind of scratch their head. Because what he's going to do is he's going to send and go get Paul, who was known as Saul. Uh, Look at verses 25 and 26. It says, And Barnabas left for Tarsus to go look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the church and taught considerable numbers of people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So Barnabas has been sent by the church in Jerusalem to kind of be in charge of the church in Antioch and to help them in whatever way he could. And he begins to think, you know what? These people need more than what I can give them. And so he thinks, i got to find somebody who can help these people, people go deeper in their faith. And so what does he do? He leaves and he goes and looks for Saul. Because he knew that Saul would be able to teach them. And Barnabas knew about Saul's encounter with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus and about how he had been converted. But here's the, here's the thing about Barnabas. Do you see the humility of Barnabas? He's like, I can't do this on my own. I'm not talented enough. I, I'm not smart. I need to go get somebody else to, who can come in here and be more effective. And so he goes, ridding himself of all pride. And he goes and finds Saul. And that's shocking that he goes and finds Saul. Because if you remember, the people, the Christians, the way the church got started in Antioch was that there were people who were trying to flee the persecution at the hand of Saul. And so they're hiding out in Antioch. And who does Barnabas bring to Antioch? Saul! Ah! You know? They're thinking, we just tried to get away from this guy, and now you're bringing him here? He's going to try to kill us, isn't he? They don't know that he's become a Christian yet. So anyway, it's truly amazing. Who would have thought that Saul, who was the persecutor of the church, who's trying to stamp out the church, would be the one who's helping this church grow? That's just how amazing God's plans are. And for an entire year, Saul will teach the Christians in Antioch and help them grow more mature in their faith as they follow Jesus. And then look at the description in verse 26. The disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Before Acts chapter 11, the people who followed Jesus Christ were called many things, but never Christians. They were referred to as disciples, Followers, brethren, saints, the way, but not Christians. Some scholars uh, believe that the term Christian was first used as a derogatory term for people who followed Jesus. It meant little Christ. And so critics of Christianity might have scoffed to themselves and said, "Ha, ha, look at those people, there goes those little Christs. And so what likely began as a derogatory term became a term of endearment today for those who had followed Jesus of Nazareth. I love what David Jeremiah writes about the names of Christians and what we are called and why we are called it. I'm going to leave it on the screen if you want to take a few notes. He writes and he says, because we trust Christ, we're called believers. Because we've been born again, we're called his sons. Because we follow Christ, we are disciples Because Christ is declared as holy, us holy, we are saints. Because we work for Christ, we are servants. Because we love other Christians, we're brothers and sisters. Because we fellowship with Christ, we are friends. Because he loves us so, we are his beloved. Because he is our future, we are his heirs. But best of all, we are Christians. I like that. And so what I'm going to do is I just want to review a little bit in case some of you are still taking notes on the screen behind me. But so far we've looked at the confrontation of Peter where Peter is accused of doing some things. But Peter explains, he clarifies, and he convinces the Jews that God loves Gentiles too. And then we've looked at the actions of the church of Antioch. And they go, if you remember the church in Jerusalem sends Barnabas to Antioch to figure out what's going on. Barnabas arrives, he's like, this is beyond me. I better go get 
Saul. And so he sends for Saul. And where we're going to conclude in our text today is the point of application. And I want you to see this. It is the compassion of the church. Verses 27 and 30, through 30. Now at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. I want to talk a little bit, just very briefly, about the gift of prophecy. It was a unique gift at the first century church, much like speaking in tongues. Those spiritual gifts are not needed in the present modern day church. Uh, but sometimes the gift of prophecy meant nothing more than just simply proclaiming the truth, or what we might call preaching or exhortation. But in this instance, in Acts chapter 11, it was the gift of prophecy, meaning to predict the future. And that's what's happening here. And it was a, uh, a, uh, a, a temporary gift given to the church. Verse 28, uh, one of them named Agabus stood up and indicated by the Holy Spirit that there would definitely be a severe famine all over the world. And this took place during the reign of Claudius. This isn't the first time in the Bible that God has warned his people about a coming famine. You remember the story of uh, Joseph, don't you? When he was in Egypt and he was given the dream and the vision, interpreted the dream and the vision and said that there's going to be a famine that's coming. Well, here in the New Testament, Acts chapter 11, God is using Agabus to warn the, about the impending famine that would severely impact the people who were living there in that day. And this was so important to Dr. Luke that you know exactly when this prophecy happened that he records that it took place during the reign of Claudius. And secular history has shown that there was indeed a severe famine that took place during Claudius' rule. And Agabus prophesied Paul's arrest. He would, this isn't the only place Agabus is mentioned. In Acts chapter 21, he predicted that, that uh, Paul was going to be arrested and that was accurate as well. So Agabus was a true and trustworthy prophet. But that's not why this was recorded here in these verses. The reason this was recorded in Scripture was so that you and I would learn about how the church responded. Look at verse 29. It's amazing. And to the extent that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution, a financial gift, for the relief of the brothers and the sisters living in Judea. And they did this, sending it with Barnabas and Saul to the elders. Let me explain what's happening. This is talking about the church in Antioch. All right, This was the church plant that took place. And this is totally backwards from how it functions today, isn't it? Um, usually it's the mother church that's supporting the church plant. That, oh man, they've got a need, let's give them some money. In Acts chapter 11, it's the exact opposite. It's the church plant over here in Antioch who's taking up an offering, a collection, to help out their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem who are going to be facing a terrible famine. And isn't it interesting that these Gentile Christians are showing compassion for their Jewish brethren, brothers and sisters? The Gentiles are showing the Jews what it means to be a Christian. I think that's awesome. And so make a note of this, because this is how the church was meant to be. And I love that we are doing this here at Burnside. I see it all the time. A need is made known. I love that. We have needs all over this county, this country, and this world. And a need is, is, is usually, this is how it works, a need is made known. And that was what was happening here in Acts chapter 11. Agabus tells them about a need that's going to take place and is going to be needed in Jerusalem. They're going to need some food. And so a need is made known. But then notice what happens next. The need is met. And that's the way the church was meant to be. That's what it was meant to be. And I love that we're doing this at Burnside Christian Church. We've been taking up an offering for Keith Lawson. I don't know him. Uh, but he's having a surgery, a pretty significant surgery. And my understanding is, I don't think he's a Christian. I don't think he goes to church. And how amazing is it that we hear about a need, we don't necessarily know him, he's not even a brother of ours, but we're helping him out. Why? Because we love Jesus, it's the right thing to do. And I hope that the gift that is given and the gift that is received, that that's going to impact him in an amazing way. And maybe he will get to one day come to faith in Jesus Christ. 
A need is made known, a need is met. That is how the church is supposed to function. You guys know about the generosity of this church. I could go into detail after detail, story after story about how this church has fulfilled needs, but I won't do that. But this is what you need to understand, that Sir William Ramsey believes that Agabus made this prophecy about a famine taking place in 44 A.D. And the famine came in 46 A.D. And so if that was true, the church in Antioch had two years to prepare to raise money to help their brethren who were living in Judea who would be most severely affected by the famine. That's how the church is supposed to function. Regardless of the color of your skin, your age, your differences, the church is supposed to meet the needs of those who have needs. Plain and simple. Well, after all this time we've spent studying the story of Cornelius being the first Gentile convert to have his story fully detailed, we find ourselves at the church in Antioch. And that's going to be of great significance because from this point on, from Acts chapter 11 on, Antioch will be the means by which the final part of Jesus' commission to the apostles will be fulfilled. Remember that? How this whole thing started? Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Before Jesus ascends back into heaven, he's got his apostles and he's giving them their final marching orders. And he says, you will receive power with the Holy, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in both Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and as far as the remotest parts of the earth. And so roughly 10 years has passed since Jesus gave these, these orders uh, to his apostles. And finally, the last part of taking the gospel to the remotest part of the earth will begin and will continue the mission through the church of Antioch. And Antioch will be the center of evangelism for the rest of the book of Acts. Jerusalem will be important, but Antioch will be the focus. Well, today we're going to come to our time decision in just a moment, but I want to pray for us as a church that we would continue to be a church where needs are made known and the needs are met. And that can be a wide variety of needs, whether it be spiritual, emotional, or physical needs. We want to be a church that's being obedient to the call of the gospel. Let's pray, and then we're going to have our time decision here today.